We come to the final component of the armour of God and as Paul puts it in Ephesians 6, that, and take to yourselves the sword of the Spirit which is the Word of God. So uh, the final piece of this armour is defined as the Word of God. We've just concluded, uh, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit which is the Word of God. I like the insertion of the word and. It would seem that they go together. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So it's a conjunction. Uh, It attaches or connects the two things, and rightly so, because The Word of God here is especially a reference to the incarnate Word of God, the incarnate Word of God, the the term that is used in this particular instance is the word rhema, R-H-E-M-A, rhema. There are two words that speak to this expression, word, word. One is the term logos, L-O-G-O-S, and the other is the term rhema, R-H-E-M-A. Now rhema is an expression, whereas logos uh, is about the thing as it is, the thing as it is, meaning an embodying or the embodying of a concept or idea. So you've got two things going on here. One is expression and the other is the substance of the thing even if the thing is not expressed. So logos exists whether or not it's expressed. That's why when in John 1, in the Gospel of John chapter 1, where it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The term used there for Word is Logos, L-O-G-O-S, Logos. And that's, that's because before the Word became a fleshly expression, It was. It existed. We, we, in this series, we've referenced Proverbs 8, uh, which speaks of the pre-creation Christ, Christ as referenced in pre-creation, where He is always with God. And in some senses, this is what John is wishing to convey to us in the Gospel of John, that He is always the Logos. He is is the personhood of God embodying all of the precepts of God. He is the architect of creation because creation is an expression of that which already exists as God and exists in God. So logos is the representation, in in the term logos is meant to be captured the pre-existent God in all of the manifestations of God, 
Father, Son, and Spirit. The intentions of God later to be expressed as Father and Son. So in some senses, the expression in flesh, the incarnation in flesh is rhema. It is the activated truth that has previously existed. But the truth existent without expression and of course before creation which was designed for the expression of God, that His divine nature and eternal purposes would be put on display in creation. Uh, Before creation, before the display, there was God. That's why it simply says, in the beginning uh, was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It parallels the Genesis account that begins in a similar fashion. In the beginning, God. And then so all of what follows as creation is the rhema of divine expression. Now obviously, divine expression incarnate is going to be uh, inseparable from in terms of the tautological connection between the two. existence and expression. What is being expressed is that which is existent. In laboring to create this understanding, I want to set forth before you why the Word of God is so quick and powerful, why the Word of God vis-a-vis lies, deception, uh, and every scheme of the enemy is so utterly powerful as to be defined as sharper than any two-edged sword capable of separating between soul and spirit like a weapon of this, a physical weapon of this kind, a sword of this kind may separate between joint and marrow because the force of the expression, the force, the power of the rhema is that it is in fact the incarnation of the being who is truth that is defined as Logos. That's the basis of the promise that heaven and earth would pass away, but the nature of God cannot be diminished by the passing of time, number one, and moreover that all that is visible is held together by the power of the being inasmuch as it is the expression of the being himself. These are things that we, uh, growing up, if, if you grew up in the charismatic movement, the emphasis has been placed on rhema, even Bible schools uh, that took on that name and it has been falsely alleged that somehow rhema is both separate from logos and preferable to logos. You know, one of the reasons why we are noticing the collapse of so many ministries today and the the discrediting of so many prominent preachers today is because things they have done and said and things that they have established, even the basis of their ministries, were not in fact accurate. 
when, when you build a structure with, quote, untempered mortar, namely that it is not the truth, the structure will fall. We're warned against putting weight on walls that have been constructed with untempered mortar. The mixture is wrong. If you put weight on it, it may not collapse in the first day. It may not collapse in the first decade or the first or, 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 or ten decades in some instances, but it will collapse eventually because it lacks the internal integrity. So charismatics by and large, and especially those of the variety that we have come to call the name it and claim it bunch, the Kenneth Copelands of the world, their emphasis on Rhema is really a self-serving emphasis in that they have never felt compelled to authentically exegete the Scriptures. And instead of the unshakable character of God supporting what they have alleged, they defaulted to a different standard that might be, uh, uh, that might be summarized as the I just feel like standard. And that's why they may attribute to the Holy Spirit whatever foolishness they've imagined. And the Lord knows that the abundance of foolishness that they've routinely advocated, exceeded by many times, any actual substantive truth. So, if the interpretation of Scripture is, has become personalized to serve the idea of gain as an emphasis, then it becomes hyping it becomes the hyping of the human soul. There is no witness of the Holy Spirit born to the serious believer, but there is a witness to the human soul. There is no witness to the human spirit, but there is a witness to the human soul. Because the soul is the theatre in which the lust of the particular human are emphasized and played out. Over the years I have observed a striking connection between those who love multi-level marketing, as was practiced by companies such as Amway, uh, multi-level marketing, and those who love the prosperity gospel. I also found that there was a stunning deficiency in their understanding of Scripture, even basic Scripture. They knew all the Scriptures on giving and prosperity, but did not understand the basic structure of Scripture. the allegations about what the Holy Spirit said and did or what He would say and what He would do was reduced to whatever pleased them. Now you know there was going to be a reckoning because if it does not have the integrity of the person of the Logos, whatever the expression is, it is in fact not Rhema because Rhema cannot be separated from Logos, inasmuch as what I speak 
cannot be separated from who I am. I'm not a disembodied voice. Behind the voice is a man. Now, more to the point, if the man himself lives in contradistinction from what he says, then that term, the appropriate term that defines the man is hypocrisy. He's a hypocrite. The word hypocrisy is the old Greek theater word in plays like Sophocles, written by Sophocles, Aeschylus, and, and some of the writers, Euripides, who wrote plays, the actors wore masks. So if they were playing the part of a comedy, they would wear a laughing mask. If they were playing the part of a tragedy, if the actors were playing the part of a tragedy, they would wear a frowning mask. And the, construct, the construction of the mask was such that they held it in front of their faces and the design was to amplify their voice behind the mask and that term, the term for mask and the whole event of the actor pretending to be whatever the laughing or, or crying mask, frowning mask was, everybody understood that the actors had personalities in their daily lives that were different from the roles that they were playing. So the word that the Greeks applied to a role playing separate and apart from the reality of the actor was the word hypocrite, hypocrite. In that context, to be a hypocrite was the same as being an actor. If you ran into the actor in town or at, uh, you know, at, the, at the Agora, the marketplace, you didn't say, oh, there is, uh, there is Dionysus the hypocrite. <laughs> you, you would separate the man from the role he played later that day in the theatre uh, over in the auditorium. You would understand there is the man, whatever his name would be, uh, Alexander, uh, Diotrephes, uh, Dionysus, whatever Greek name he had. Uh, and women played no roles, by the way. Uh, it, it was considered a disgrace. So if, even if the actor were known by his real name in town, no one walked up to him and, and accused him of being a hypocrite because they understood that he was one person in town one person in the marketplace and a different person when he was on the stage. On the stage, his persona was defined by the playwright. In town, he was who he actually was. Now, what, what in this unseemly disconnect between Logos and Rhema, Hypocrisy has been legitimized in the church. If you can say whatever you want to, but it's disconnected from the reality that defines what you are to say, that preempts actually, in fact, is an absolute preemption, so that what you say cannot be different. From, what, from, the, from the nature and character of God, if the representation is of God, uh, if there's any discrepancy, then rhema is not rhema. It's something else. It's play acting and it is hypocrisy. So the whole idea that there could be revelation that trumps scripture, revelation that set aside, sets aside the plain descriptions of the nature and the character of God and to allege that somehow that was the Holy Spirit 
is to make God a liar. This is how serious it is. And it would mean that inevitably, inevitably, these actors would come in for judgment. And so would their works, because there's a day in which the works are tried by fire. I, I find that to be quite interesting in this regard that God is said to be a consuming fire. So in the day when God appears to hold accountable by the Logos that which has been alleged to be Rhema, nothing of the actors will survive, it will be burned up, it will be burned up, nothing will be left of what they do. I think it would be interesting to see, to go back and now look and see, what has been left of the empires of some of these extremely prominent preachers of yesteryear whose allegations about Rhema were disconnected from the being of God, the Logos. Be interesting to see where they are. <laughs> Many of them, you know, were very skillful in that they utilized devices such as deferred giving, which was to get people to include the institutions they built in their will, which I, I have a serious problem with that especially if it takes the inheritance of their generations away from them. It's, it's a serious matter, but leave that aside. It would be interesting to go back now and just look at what came of the institutions and the, the things that were built in the heyday of those who alleged Rhema as an example, I mean this would be more widely applicable than I'm saying, but I'm illustrating the point uh, to see what has happened to, their, to the empires that were built um, by separating what they said from what was known of the person of God. Because that actually is a very objective way of defining what is the Word of God. Now the Word of God, to go back to the prior uh, focus when we began this, as we referenced how heaven and earth would pass away, before God Himself would pass away, before the Logos would pass away. And therefore, the Word of God, the Rhema, the spoken, if you prefer, the incarnation in, in any form that God designs, the incarnation of the truth of the personhood of God, has the capacity, like a sword, and indeed the sword of the Spirit, to absolutely destroy any and every falsehood that the enemy has established with the intent of taking the place of what is true. So the sword of the Spirit is the, is the particular piece of the armour of God by which the works of the devil will be laid bare in all of their pretended folly and come to nothing, even the enemy himself will come to nothing, when the standard of divine rectitude known as the Logos has been brought forth 
to measure and to judge that which has been alleged to be of God so that the deception upon which it is built and that is woven throughout the fabric of the falsehood is dismantled and and is then unraveled. Nothing has the capacity to overcome whatever God is saying at the time that He's saying it. Nothing ultimately has the power to overcome that because it is based in who God Himself is and has been for endless ages, for ages past and ages to come. One of the meanings of the word eon and the meaning in particular that applies to God is age upon age or endless ages. Time, you see, does not determine anything about God. It's wrong to ask the question, where was God when? Time was created by God to serve Him. And when time in its various epochs has been concluded, what God intended to perfect during that age is the only thing that will survive the age and moves from age to age and becomes as eternal and as unshakable as God Himself. The enemy cannot overcome the Logos and he is ultimately going to be shown to be ineffectual if he invades against the Rhema. In this then, we may stand with the absolute certainty that the Word of God eventually will be proven to be correct. You don't have to war at the time with with what anyone else is saying. God hasn't sent us to dismantle anybody's constructions. He has sent us to declare the truth in the face of it. And when we do, eventually, that word will judge everything. And you will be vindicated whenever Christ is revealed through His Word because you will be revealed with Him. In this way, we'll overcome all the works of the devil. There's much more to be said about the armor of God, but in these efforts, my hope was to upgrade your understanding from Sunday school level to present tense, to present circumstances, so that you might understand how the workings of the mighty power of God has been, has been released through these elements of the armor of God. And whoever is clothed with, quote, the whole armor of God is destined to triumph over the enemy and to reveal the sovereignty of God in any and in every age. There is no construct of the enemy, be it the cosmos or the momentary deceptions that can survive when God clothes those who put their trust in Him and when we are clothed upon by the power of God as defined in these portions of the armor of God. I commend you to God and to the word of His grace that is able to build you up and to establish you amongst the sanctified. So may grace, mercy, and peace be with you always. May these messages equip you in this hour to stand your ground 
and to stand in your appointed places. For the days are growing dark and evil is taking over the hearts of men. But you, you are the light of the world. You cannot be hid. You will not be put in obscurity, but you will be put in prominent places to be the light and glory of God upon the earth in your day and in your time. May grace, mercy, and peace be with you always. Amen.